my heart just recently, and I, it's, it's, it's a perfect description, if you read the words or listen to the words, of a manger scene that we see here, and all the people that are involved in characters and such, and the shepherds and the wise men, and uh, the animals even came and worshiped Jesus and in wonderment of what they have experienced already, and the shepherds being alerted by the angels that Jesus was going to be born, and they rushed to the scene and, and attended to him. And it's just a moving song to me that it describes that whole picture there that people get to sing for over 100 years now. The author who wrote that <coughs> uh, did it over 100 years ago, and we still love it today. So that's got a great message. So I got this little sidebar that I gave, the Lord gave me at the last moment, Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. If you seek me and find you, if you will seek me and find me when you seek me, with all your heart. Okay. According to Judaism, uh, the Messianic age is a time when a Messiah will bring us back to a kind of world that God originally intended for us to be in. This time is described in the, by a number of prophets. Further references to the Messiah can also be found in Psalms. A large number of these have to do with the future birth of the Messiah, which Christians recognize as Christmas. This is a hope that the, these prophets had and the people of Israel had for, for a very, very long time, and to see the Messiah come. Matter of fact, many of them are still waiting for him. We recognize as Jesus as the Messiah, the promised one. So hope is the theme for today. So let's take a look at some of the prophecies about the birth of Jesus, our Messiah. We are told through Abraham's offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. Christians believe Jesus is the fulfillment of this promise. We know that Jesus was the offspring of Abraham. Abraham, um, at, it was about 2,000 years before Jesus' birth that Abraham spoke of this. It's about 2,000 years. A long time, right? We also know that from the line of, that he is from the line of Jacob, Abraham's, Abraham's grandson. In Numbers 24, 17, I see him, but now I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. In Isaiah, from Isaiah 11, 1, we know that he is from the line of Jesse and the father of King David. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. So we know that Jesus is the branch. So much of these prophecies speaks of Jesus that if we see them, it's amazing to see how God always intended for Jesus to come. From Jeremiah 23, 5, and 6, we know that he is in the line of, da of King David. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, again, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. This is the name by which he will be called, uh, be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. We know that Jesus is our righteous Savior. Reaffirming that Jesus is from the line of David, we have a prophecy from 2 Samuel 7, 12, and 13, which it was actually spoken by Samuel to King David. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will, build, who will build a house for my name, and I will establish his throne 
and his kingdom forever. We know that Jesus is the offspring of David. He's born in the lineage of David. And he's talking about him. From the prophecy of Makkah 5.2, we know that he was born into the tribe of Judah in the region of Ephratha, in the town of Bethlehem. But you, Bethlehem, Ephratha, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come one who will be ruler over all Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. In Isaiah 7, 14, it says, He was born of a virgin. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin will be with child, and he will give, you, give birth to a son, and you will call him Emmanuel. The Emmanuel, name Emmanuel means God with us, which indicates the divinity of Jesus. That was Isaiah 7, 14, which was about 700 years before Christ was born. Jesus would be worshipped by shepherds from the desert and from foreign kings, present gifts to him revealed in Psalm 72, 9 through 10. May the desert tribes bow before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarnish and of distant shores bring tribute to him. May the kings of Sheba and Serba present him gifts. May all the kings bow down to him and all nations serve him. We know that this happened. It's even a description of it right here. In response to this attempt on the life of Jesus, Joseph was warned in a dream to take Jesus to Egypt, where he stayed until, he, until Herod died. This was predicted in Hosea 11.1. 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, Egypt, I call my son. And we know that this happened as well. So all these prophecies, it's just an amazing evidence. And there's like so many more, so many more that prophesize the coming of the Messiah, Jesus. And their hope that they had in the Messiah coming, their Savior, they were going to rescue Israel from all its enemies. And they longed for, for centuries, even a couple of thousand years as far back as Abraham, and, uh, and he came, he came. That's who we honor today. That's the hope that we have today. That's the, the dwelling in us that we, we long for for so long, and trusting and loving and coming to Jesus with all our problems and difficulties and struggles. These were the hopes that the sons of Abraham had, the Messiah, the Savior, born. And there was just a few of these. The birth of Jesus foretold in Luke. Um, we know the story, most of us. And this is the hope that Mary experienced when, when she uh, was visited by an angel, Gabriel, the, one of the most mightiest angels. <clears throat> the birth of Jesus foretold in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy in Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. God sent an angel, Gabriel, to Nazareth, a town of Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Okay. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel of the Lord said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and you will be called, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Sounds exactly like one of the prophecies. So it's almost you know, really close. 
And that was in Second Samuel it said that. I almost, almost verbatim. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she was said to be unable to conceive this in her sixth, she is to conceive this in her sixth month. So no word from God will ever fail. How about that statement? Yeah, that's true. No God, word from God will ever fail. Do not believe, as Tom talked about, that Satan will attack us and tell us this is not true. This is true. This is true. No word from God would ever fail. And Jesus is the word of God. <laughs> Jesus is the word of God. Okay. And Mary's response was this. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. So we didn't leave Joseph out of this. Our God thought of everything. In Matthew 1, 19 through 21, Joseph, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law of Moses, and yet he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind a divorce, to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. In Luke 2, 1 through 7, it talks about how God just arranges all this. It's just the most amazing thing. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census would be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everybody went to their own town to register. Most of us know all these stories, but it's important to repeat them. So Joseph also went up to the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house in the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available. So that's what we're celebrating, all the events that led up to the birth of Jesus, our, the King of Kings, our Lord and Savior Jesus. And for most of creation, this is... Everyone's been longing for this to happen. God, I think, must have been really excited about this. <laughs> he probably, all the prayers and people that were, that were longing for a Messiah and all the, the struggles that Israel has gone through, a Savior has finally arrived. A Savior has finally arrived. What a great thing. What a great thing. The most amazing event probably in the history of creation that Jesus was born into the world as a man-boy, as, as a flesh and body embodiment of God himself, and driven, and, and his father was the Holy Spirit. <laughs> How powerful is that? This is the most amazing event in all of creation, I believe. The next one would be the next biggest amazing event when, when, he, when he died for all our sin. The thrill of hope. May the God of hope fill you with all the joy and peace in believing that you may be abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's Romans 15, 13. The thrill of hope is a weary world rejoices. Where yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Oh, holy night. Jesus is born. 
Does Christmas thrill you? Children get excited about Christmas. There's a, the, the, all the lights and fanfare that we have. Look at this beautiful stage. People decorate it, and the deacons, and they, they don't want no credit for it, but they bring us this every year. It's a joyful time to consider families and, and love. Yeah, Lori Wilhelm did it. <laughs> she didn't want to acknowledge me. My wife gave me instructions, though, so... <laughs> And um, beautiful manger scene out there and, and such. And we rejoice in the fact that we, we're going to be blessed by a Christmas with our families again, our loved ones, our, our friends, and we make plans and we travel and we do all these things. Sometimes we just get worn down by all this and we almost don't experience the joy of Christmas. They say, you, you're sensing the spirit of Christmas yet? I'm like, ugh, the traffic is really bad. <laughs> We go through situations like that. Well, it's a cool thing about hope. It's the t in, just as total darkness, total darkness can't hold back the light of a tiny flame. Total darkness. You ever go out in the Everglades at night? You ever go out there on the road or something like that? There's no lights around. Some place where there's no light, how dark it is. How dark it is. But all that suppressing darkness can't even extinguish one little candle, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has no power over it. Even as the smallest increment of hope provides joy and purpose. Here are a few scriptures we were mulling over on the subject. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Notice the parallel between the things hoped for and the things not seen. Talk about a paradox. Try applying assurance to something your five senses can't even detect. It's a challenge. The plus side is that the hope, that hope applying through Christ is available no matter what you see, hear, or feel. It's above your circumstances. You know hope. I know hope. Hope is that thing that comes when nothing, when there is nothing else. I remember some situations I was in, and I remember someone saying to me, well, it was actually a guard in a jail. <laughs> he said, so you got any, so you, you gonna get out? And I said, well, things don't look good. <laughs> no one's coming to get me. He goes, so you lost all hope, huh? I said, oh, no, I didn't lose all hope. <laughs> I don't know about hope. What is that? You know, it's the most amazing thing that you can still have it in the darkest of times. It's like a little flame burning bright. Somehow, it's always there. It's above your circumstances. We also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulations brings about perseverance, and perseverance brings about proven character, proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given us, who has given it to us in Romans 5, verses 3 through 5. Do you ever hear people say, I don't want to get my hopes up. <laughs> I hear people say that. I even said that. <laughs> I don't want to get my hopes up because they're afraid of being disconnected and have something to do with they're hoping for or expecting and they don't want to be disappointed. Disappointed. So what does Paul say about that? <laughs> what does Paul say about that? He says, it does not disappoint us, hope. It does not disappoint us. The love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Love hopes all things, but, but now abide in faith, hope, and love. These are the greatest of, and the greatest of these is love. First Corinthians 13, 7 through 13. I wonder why faith, hope, and love are the greatest virtues, and apparently in that order, maybe hope isn't ex actually something we do. It's something we receive, like grace, like unmerited favor. It is true that 
without faith it is impossible for us to please God. In Hebrews 11:6, perhaps it's conversely true that without hope it is impossible for him to please us. Hope is a gift, I believe. The same verse it says that God is a rewarder of those who seek him. Hope is a reward. Amen. I mean, if faith is what we give to God and hope is what he gives to us, then we have this dynamic of a relationship. With that in place, we can love. So love is built on hope, which is built on faith. For hope to exist, unfortunately, it looks like there has to be some hopelessness first. Hopelessness first. I can relate to all that. I feel hopeless in situations that I have no strength or power over. I feel hopeless over difficulties that come my way. In all reality, I am hopeless. I just can't get through to that. But with the Lord in our lives, we do all things through Christ who strengthens us. A perfect world shouldn't have any need for hope. Deliverance arrives undeservingly and perhaps unexpectedly. Just as in an unlikely way, God came to earth to provide a once and for all substitute for our sins. And all men on that first Christmas. That's why things can look bleak, but that's where hope lives. The good news is you simply can't hope big enough which goes back to the idea of our minds and our senses being inadequate to judge God's design and methods. And hope being more of a function of God's involvement than our desires. I readily acknowledge I could not have conceived a plan of a salvation or a virgin birth I couldn't have imagined the plan of the walls of Jericho crumbling down or the hungry lions becoming Daniel's pets or the sea being parted and there'd be dry ground there for me to walk across. But the God of all hope and, and love, I believe, gives us that. Gives us that. <clears throat> and Romans 15, 13 is my Christmas prayer. May the God of all hope fill you with the joy and the peace of receiving that which may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Why is there hope? Because Jesus was born. Oh, holy night. What a thrill. God is at work. So in our lives, let us not, I believe, we can be burdened by Christmas or we can realize the true meaning of Christmas that God, our Savior, was born. And our hope is revived, and things are just exciting. I know each year I'm thinking I'm going to wear Christmas out, but it never wears out. Somehow I get into the Christmas spirit, and I rejoice that, wow, it's Christmas. Our Savior, we're rejoicing our birth of our Savior, Jesus. And to me, when I sense that and feel that way, that's the spirit of Christmas. That's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> amazing event, amazing event. To us, a child is born, a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and peace will be no end. And he will reign at David's throne over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And Isaiah said that in Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. I know I read a lot, but in my heart, I really believe in the, the power of Jesus working in our lives continuously knowing our struggles, knowing our difficulties, knowing our circumstances, knowing that we have something that we're not to heal, we should not be able to heal from, and that's a lie. And because God can do all things, what is impossible for man is possible for God. This is an example of Jesus coming, being born of a virgin, which has been prophesied 
and coming to earth as God, a God-man, and there as a baby, silent, with no crying he made. Jesus was always in control of himself even then, it seems like. And the idea of all this happening in our lives and what it means, it's not just about lights and trees and, and uh, songs that we sing, but our Savior that people have longed for centuries to see. And we get to look back and realize it. We know that Jesus loves us and he cares for us. And we know this world doesn't <laughs> and tries to discourage us. But if you're sensing any type of discouragement during this time, remember, call upon Jesus, your Lord and Savior, and he will come to you if you seek him with all your heart. He will work through all our difficulties and struggles and difficulties that we have. So many of you today have not come to know Jesus as the Lord and Savior. You can come up here now. We can do the sinner's prayer. Or if you need any healing or you need prayer about anything, you can come forward and we'll pray for you in Jesus' name.